Sunday, no, not Sunday, Saturday, Saturday, uh, July 16th, 2022. It is good to uh, keep track of uh, timestamps in your videos, not really for just general YouTube use, but for vlogging, the more pure form of vlogging, right? So what I view YouTube has sort of done here with video is what they did in earlier days with Blogger. Now I think Blogger has been uh, decommissioned, sunset, what have you, but it was the most major blogging platform. It was the most major platform for people getting their ideas out there because the infrastructure did not exist to do it by many other means, uh, self-publishing wise, than to put a blog up. You know, the days of blogger and so you would have I guess a blog it domain it had a its own separate domain from blogger where things were actually published and those are still around even though they sunset blogger and you can't use the CMS package anymore they apparently have kept the published blogs published they didn't unpublish things that were created with Blogger. And wow, what an interesting statement that is when you think about it, really. It's okay to sunset the means of production, the technical things that allow you to publish. You can say, oh, you can't use them anymore, they're gone. And that's within the realm of a company's right to do it with their own proprietary systems. They made a proprietary system called Blogger available, people used it, and then they decided to not let people use it. Poof, it's gone. Now, there was plenty of uh, ahead of time warning, so people knew this was coming, and if they wanted to export their content in a more CMS pure form, database type form, they could always do it. But that uh, doesn't mean they couldn't always have gotten it from the published site as well. You can extract original content, you can unstylize published content. You know, particularly stuff that used very predictable patterns, like these blog publishing systems of those days used. And what were the blog publishing systems of those days? What options were there other than Blogger, and are they still around? Well, of course, the super big one, WordPress, is very much still around. Belt Parkway left the name of it. That's what I'm going to want. When I do these kinds of rides through Brooklyn, my main way of not getting lost now, I believe, is to use the Belt Parkway, that's what it's called. And that's the Coney Island, you know, uh, view of the New York Harbor. I guess that would be east side uh, route across Brooklyn. I like that. It makes me feel a little bit New York or whatever. Iconic New York. Coney Island stuff see the needle that looks like the Seattle restaurant needle, but it was some uh, maybe retired Coney Island ride. I gotta get my histories right. A parachute ride that is no longer in use. We ask ourselves what's important. The answer is often the information. The um, ability for information to become an experience. Information can become an experience. Either a vicarious experience by releasing the information directly for decoding into, say, a human mind. And you can read along with a story, get immersed, essentially melt into the role of the protagonist character, the hero, the main focus of the book you're reading. This can be done through other means of uh, 
you know, pouring media into your body that's more highly compatible with your visual processing centers and your audio processing, in other words, through movies, which is a completely different experience than reading the book. There is something about humanity that is revealed there. There are those who will enjoy a good book. Bell Parkway. Yep, I'm going on the Bell Parkway. This is what I have to remember to do this. Leftmost exit when going over the Verrazano Bridge. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. I have two phones in play, one for directions and one for uh, shooting the video. Uh, even though my iPhone is the only one that has the cellular connection as part of its, you know, it's being my main phone. It's the other one I'm using for navigation, for GPS. So I guess it downloaded all the map data it needed uh, home side where it did have access to the Wi-Fi network. And then I set it up in its own separate um, phone holder. Speak of the devil. And I have it on its own uh, phone holder down here. I wish I had a third phone or camera to show you a picture of these two phones, the way they're mounted on the dash. One for shooting the videos, and the other for showing me the GPSs. I got lost on my way back on this ride when I decided to try and shoot video on my ride back. Because how hard could it be to come back and cut across Brooklyn and end up on the other side. Um, well, it turns out you can end up in Queens, and that's what I did. I ended up in Queens. I was lost in Queens. Uh, one of my viewers pointed it out to me, and I updated the title of, of the video. It's funny what becomes popular, I mean popular at my scale on YouTube. Popular at my scale on YouTube is that it'll reach a hundred views, most of which are just partial views, you know, people don't watch and saw things. I would guess that every once in a while there's a video that just captures someone's fancy because what I'm talking about resonates with them right now, what's going on in their own life, and just statistically speaking, I'll be connecting with people who, you know, need that connection for whom... Uh, they are working through similar things in life and the way it goes with me the kind of subject matter I churn up is that people don't know this stuff exists people don't know that this is why the world is the way it is they have some vague notion that C is an important programming language that comes through on a lot of people who start their technology quest that so many things are written in some version of a primitive C at their base form, that this is some sort of grandparent language. However, it is not a grandparent language of all of tech. It is a grandparent language of recent years, and the one who's, you know, coming onto the scene really birthed the digital electronics era because it coupled with a few other uh, innovations like Unix, TCPIP, the web, Linux, and uh, generally the free um, and open source, FOS, free and open source software movement. The general public license, the work of Richard Matthew Stallman and the GNU Foundation, and how, you know, a good system for computer science worth copying is worth putting a lot of energy into copying so we can at least have a good enough tool now. And that's the tools I'm advocating. There was a magical moment that I was tangentially connected to where all this copying of Ken Thompson's original work from Bell Labs was accepted as the direction computers in general should be going, and everyone threw their towel into the ring. Even Microsoft had a version 
of Unix called Xenix, X-E-N-I-X. So there were prior versions of Unix from Microsoft, Xenix. This was in like 1990, 1991. And this is right about when the Amiga was dying. So the, the Amiga was dying when the first sure signs of Unix's prevailing were starting to show. And that is all the vendors agreeing on what Unix should be. There was this POSIX standard, which plays a much less important role now. Today, as Linux pulls ahead, as Linux pulls ahead, POSIX is less important. But in those days, there was this portable operating system standard. Here's what, Lin here's what Unix consists of. You put these things into a Unix and will rubber stamp it and say, this is an official Unix. And this evolved around, you know, it was no longer called Bell Labs Unix. It was now zero, uh, AT&T, AT&T's Unix. So it was AT&T System 5 Release 4, SVR4 is what it was colloquially called, SVR4. And uh, all the vendors agreed on it, including Wacky Wacky Sun with their Solaris. They're like, yeah, we'll come on board with this. Solaris will be S SVR5 compatible. They might even have thrown in a few things to make sure it was of a sufficient enough stand quality to satisfy Sun's requirements. Because Sun was the, you know, snooty workstation graphics company on the scene that could afford to say, Unix has to be this in order to support our applications that people are using every day. So that was the Spark Workstation, Graphics Suites, whatever those things were. The precursors to being able to do uh, Jurassic Park like movies, right? So the Sun Workstations, uh, the CGI, was all being birthed around the same time, 1990, 1991. So, a lot of stuff ha happened in those days that's resonating, that has, you know, caused a lot of repercussions, repercussions that are only fully being realized and appreciated today. And these things go in like 20 year cycles because Unix wasn't born in the 90s. Unix was born in the 70s, 1970. The same age I am, in 50 miles from where I was born, and in the same year that the game of life was created. Not the board game of life, but the game of life where you can watch rules play out on your computer monitor to see patterns created that follow the same scavenging for food and reproduction rules as real life and movement and how things relate to each other and the amazing magical patterns that seem almost, you know, alive, life, that if you stop your computer, you may never be able to get back to that same pattern again because extreme variations based on initial conditions. And even though there's no random, the computer's ability to create true random is profoundly more limited than you would think at first glance. You would think, oh, there's some component you can throw into there, and every time you read from the component, you've got a random number. The universe doesn't turn out to work well that way, at least not yet at, like, an economical, you know, economically. Right? True random seems to be built into the quantum foam, the rippling of the quantum substrate from which particles are created. This is an interesting area I'm driving through now. It's, uh, ceases to look and feel like Brooklyn and starts to look like a seashore community. I'm passing you know, some facilities with a big word beach on it, some named beach. It's Plum Beach, I think. So in the 70s, Unix is created. In the 90s, Unix is standardized. In the 90s, Unix is also black boxed sufficiently to dodge all legal, you know, um, encumberments. So there was Linux, of course, which came out in 91, 
But then there was the free BSD movement, which was the black boxing of Berkeley system distribution, the very popular Unix that was also going on. So side by side were these endeavors to free Unix slash Unix-like operating systems from their high-end hardware and intellectual property uh, binds, the bonds, the binds that held Unix back. It also had some pretty hefty system requirements, which the systems of the day did not really accommodate that well. Which is one of the reasons why Linux. Excuse me. Linux targeted 386 hardware. Operating systems target hardware. Operating systems need to be made for specific hardware. It does not seem like it should have to be so. Hence, BCPL, C, Unix, Linux. That is the lineage, that is the heritage you are associating with when you jump onto the Unix-like operating system bandwagon. It's not purist about its own ideals. Its own ideals arise from a variety of scientists and co computer people from the halls of Bell Lab. And I believe a few other schools were thrown in. These ideas were a mishmash compilation. From here came piping, from there came everything is a file, and from here came keep a, you know, a small set of versatile commands. Make the commands short in name. LS is for list. CD is for change directory or current directory. PWD is for print working directory. So all commands are fairly short, two or three letters long. And then they have unlimited seeming command line arguments. You can argue them into having different behavior arguments. Here's the standard way you interface with this application. It's the application interface, it's your API. So the command line is a basic application program interface. If your file doesn't need some other file, if it stands on its own, meaning it's probably a compiled piece of code for that operating system, for that hardware, see? Every piece of code that can just run without an external interpreter, compiler, what have you, must have been pre-compiled for your particular hardware or a layer, a translation layer, that your hardware makes available as a universal application translation layer. Not quite a virtual machine, but you can call it a virtual machine if you want. So hardware has machine instruction codes and memory addresses. These are the two basic magic incantations deep down in the hardware. Things can talk to each other in the hardware. Things have mechanisms to talk to things on the hardware. These mechanisms, while the overall system can be quite complex, can be simplified to think about by The API conventions that have become Unix, Linux, Unix-like operating system standards. Things can talk to each other as binary or text. There is an already decodable system called text so that things like this can interoperate with each other by passing text around. Text has meaning that transcends the implementation details of the hardware. Presumably one piece of hardware can load a text file just as well as another piece of hardware. So text data types take on a special meaning. The mechanisms by which these data types get around, the implementation details might be very complex. But if you have something sitting there looking like a command line that you can
can type commands to, and words can be echoed back at you, printed back at you, what have you, their language, you know, the labels to describe behavior changes. You'll have to excuse me. There's not great ways to get this across, but you don't really need graphics on a computer if everything is run by text. But you would say, oh, the characters of the text is graphics, so there's still graphics. Yes, there's super simplified graphics somewhere so that the code you're putting in binary can be represented as hexadecimal or something like it on your screen. So you can see it's not really hexadecimal. That would give you more binary, a uh, human readable version of binary. You have to go one beyond that to decoding. There's a decoding step where this hexadecimal number maps to a lowercase a and this other one maps to an uppercase a. And today we really use Unicode for all this, but it wasn't always that way. There were a bunch of different encodings. So when machines are saying, hi, how you doing to each other, one of the important details is uh, an agreed upon text file encoding format, which is yet another innovation that came from Ten Ken Thompson. I believe he gave us UTF-8, which is a way to cram the uh, binary address space of Unicode, which is some ridiculously high number of glyphs that will presumably never run out of glyph space. Mapping that into old-fashioned 8-bit text files, UTF-8 means Unicode text formatting in 8-bit. So you can actually format full Unicode and then cram it into old-fashioned text files, which could be loaded up with old-fashioned text editors. It's just that it all wouldn't make sense. It would look like gobbledygook in there because, you know, bits side by side are used for each other, with each other to construct a bit of a sufficient length. It's highly efficient. It's, a, it's an excellent 80-20 rule solution, as was Unix itself. Unix was an 80-20 rule solution to Minix, to this... Uh, dystopian future that was coming down on us by taking the work of Fernando Corbato, who took the work from people before him, but said, hey, here's how we can timeshare our computers. Here's how we can use a valuable computing resource that has to be centralized out of practical necessity, because computers were so big in those days, and had to be maintained by such a staff, a priestly staff of people. And so IBM was in the game in these early days, but so were other companies that were sort of dabbling in it. And they realized that this stuff could only mainstream in a big way, and they could only compete with IBM, really. Let's, let's face it, IBM called their time-sharing operating system at the time the compatible, the compatible time-share system. Compatible time-sharing system. So once you get one IBM in running the compatible time-sharing system, every other piece of hardware you buy and you add to your network has to be compatible. It's a brilliant marketing campaign that was built into the naming convention and the very new tools for thinking about computers that we were training ourselves to have. This was new stuff. Therefore, how IBM brands it is how the world is. Multix was a multi-vendor, multi-company consortium. Honeywell, General Electric, MIT themselves, and of course AT&T getting together saying, well, we can't let IBM steal all this. So collectively, we together can take this other system that's much like it, invented by Fernando Corbato, and we can write it for our respective hardware. So there was not the portability concept, you see. Multics would be implemented for every custom piece of hardware that came out, which was okay because custom hardware was supposed to be this, like, 
you know, floor of a building size piece of equipment that stays centralized, stays tightly under the control of companies who are large enough to have such pieces of, of equipment. And then the operating system becomes a cash register. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. You connect into these computing resources through dumb terminals, VT100s and other terminals that use this trick that, yeah, text is graphics, but it can be through these thunking layers where the actual processing capability locally doesn't have to be as much as you would think to show text characters on the screen. It's actually can be built at $100 a pop versus, you know, 100,000 a pop for the time-sharing computers. But they were coming down to refrigerator size, sometimes very large industrial refrigerators, in the case of digital equipment corporations, faxes. So they were becoming more proprietary flavors of Unix, taking the parts of Unix that were useful, but still being their own proprietary, providing crazy things that that special hardware brings to the picture. That's what Digital Equipment Corporation was doing these days with their VAXs. I used to log into a VAX, the CBM VAX. Commodore had one. Their power came in being in pairs of two or four or whatnot. So of course Commodore had one. And this was the CBM VAX maintained by the beloved George Robbins. So every big computer company had the guy or the people, the culture there, who slept there. Computers were such a big part of their life and that centralized aspect that the VAX stays here, aspect of it, was so powerful that those geeks lived where that computer was to get the computing time nobody else was using before time sharing and then after time sharing to make sure that they got the use of when the usage was most low because even with time sharing there were still scheduling and availability issues you got more computing resources when other people were not an inverse relationship between how much computing you did versus when uh, other people got were using the computers even given time sharing Consequently, to get the most computing time, you lived on vampire hours. You lived in inverse waking, sleeping relationship, and you stayed near the computer. So every university, every major corporation had these people. George Robbins, was it? Am I getting it? No, yeah, Tony Robbins, the uh, motivational guy is why I get it. But no, I think I have it right. And he was one of the first of this... A Commodore crew to pass. He died early. And a great outpouring of sympathy went out for him. He was quite beloved. And he wrote some of the stuff, I believe, for the early Amiga operating systems. He came to the picture later than the original Amiga developers. But he was one of the ones who meshed right into the Amiga way of doing things, as did Dave Haney, Bryce Nesbitt, and a bunch of other people who were there because of the Amiga, Carl Sassenrath. He might have went back to the original Amiga team, I forget, but Carl was big into the graphics, squeezing <coughs> the most graphics capabilities out of these quirky sign of the time computers that were the Amiga. Planar graphics versus uh, chunky bitmap. So, um, could do a lot of really cool animation tricks. It made a lot of smooth graphics and great video games for its time. But it was stuck in 1985, 86 technology. It was stuck in 1985 technology that looked like 1995 technology through 1995. So when technology really caught up and surpassed what the Amiga looked like it was, the Amiga was dead for all intents and purposes. While fine, some version, some zombie, I'm not dead yet, you know, some Black Knight of the uh, Monty Python uh, skit, I'm not dead yet, uh, rendition of the Amiga always comes back. I believe there's even keychain versions of the Amiga based on the uh, 
Raspberry Pi Zero or something. Even the Raspberry Pi Zero, the $5 version of a computer because it doesn't have multi-cores and it doesn't have connectors, is enough computing power, if I have this correct, I might have it wrong, but if not, someone should go make this because it's probably true, has enough computing power to make an Amiga 500 on a keychain. So things have really changed and the spirit of these early computers that could fit a lot of computing power because of cleverness onto a small bit of hardware keep coming back because those make good core computing units, basic units of computing. You know, the vendors keep trying to come up with a simple net network unit of computing, a NUC. Intel even has uh, some devices, I believe it's Intel, have, have their NUC devices that come in different look and shapes. Oh. I apparently need to keep left. There's going to be a sharp left coming up to keep on. Also pay attention to directions here. It's still only 8.30 and I'm, uh, I believe, more than halfway there. In a quarter mile, use the left two lanes to take the exit towards Southern State Parkway. So shall I do. Yeah, it's really nice to be able to shoot video and also have GPS at the same time. Two phones is an advantage in life. Is the left two lanes to take the exit towards Southern State Parkway. It's not merely about being multi-core because that puts a lot of the management responsibility one and a half miles. onto some upper level of software. You're calling for sort of a hierarchy in your uh, systems that can manage multiple cores, each one to its best capability. And so there are certain development styles that lean into this. You can use methods of development that, you know, allow you to put whole tasks over to one core and whole tasks over to another core. And uh, that would be like single core development. Develop things like you only have a single core. And then know that you can always just run that whole system using container technologies on one of the cores of your machine, and that can be the way you divvy up multi-core capabilities of hardware. You make, you scale by using single core instances, and you can run as many single core instances as you have CPUs or cores uh, in your CPU. If you have an eight core CPU, you could have eight single core machines. And that bodes very well for Python versions of scaling. That's, that's a good way for Python to scale because the global interpreter lock keeps you from using multi-core in certain situations. But that is not a liability if you are guaranteed the full resources of the machine, you see? If you use container technology to create a single core container, virtual but not virtual local machine, CH root, you know, it's just you're using CH root with good memory management so you don't have to dump all your old stuff from memory. You can kind of also keep the host memory in memory readily because the, <laughs> the non-Amiga-like resource management component of Linux is so profoundly good that one can do that. And that was evolved in layers. First came KVM, the kernel virtual machine. A part of the kernel so compelling that they decided to make it part of the main trunk of Linux, the main distro of Linux. Now KVM is built in. And KVM is the main trick that pretty much everything now but Docker, because Docker decided to do it in its own way still, for better security, I believe, the argument goes, because KVM provides some pretty low-level access to the hardware. If you want to containerize full development platforms, 
LXD through the Unix, no, LXD through the Canonical um, sponsored project seems to be the way to go. Easy containerization through a API that's exposed through a program called LXC that gets installed with LXD. Nothing is perfect. One has to learn where to set their compromises. Sometimes the compromises are set in the use of proprietary software. You rely on something that you know will not be around in two to five years. Comfortable with the fact you'll be able to make the transition then. You'll be able to export the files from whatever proprietary system and import the files to some other system where you can comfortably continue to work, you see. Portability of your home system is still what you're looking for, even if you're using proprietary technologies. So I have a friend now who's advocating, why don't I just give up on this LXD stuff? But I haven't really even tried that hard. I'm just in the middle of a very busy time in life. Moving, reconnecting with my kid. And uh, the general slowdown of uh, summer activities, summer heat. Summer vacation. Some are in need of a rest. So I'm going to try to get back to working at full tilt like you've seen me at recently in my talking head videos. Talking head videos are fun and they push things ahead in a clever uh, life hack way. What is the life hack? Commitment and consistency. Especially if live casting. When I live cast, you see me at the edge of my capabilities. You see me feeling through the state of tech. And I'll tell you a few things about the state of tech. The most important things to know about the state of tech. Of course, the first part goes large swaths of tech. Percentages of what's going on. The amount of scientists, the amount of financial people, the amount of university courses and students and, you know, sci, uh, Comp Sci 101s that have settled down around a technology that has a certain sameness and likeness to it that will make you feel comfortable no matter where you go has occurred, is occurring, is inevitably playing out. And that is Unix-like operating systems. Unix-like operating systems is a flavor of using computers. It's a style and technique of interacting with computers. It's an API, it's an application program interface for machines that a lot of people can agree on so that systems can be made whose components are automated machines. And these machines are automated in such a way <clears throat> that different human beings can step in and go, oh, yep, I understand what that's doing. That's tech. And that's what Unix-like operating systems are now today. It hasn't been that way always, and it will not be that way in every case. There are specialized technologies for edge cases that are better for those edge cases. There have been and there always will be. And this mostly consists of a language-like environment, which is also an operating system-like environment, because come on, what's the difference? Being written directly for the hardware. Fortran has had this aspect to its personality. It has been written directly for the IBM systems on which it was run. That's Fortran's heritage. It has been ported to many other pieces of hardware over the years, and with the rise of C, even, yes, the mighty Fortran true grandparent language of tech has yielded to the portable operating system way 
as advocated by Unix-like operating systems, usually written in C because that's where the virtual machine-like portability comes from. There is a great thunking. The entire digital electronics world has a great reduction in resolution and clarity of the world it's interacting with. That's through digital sampling. You hear those sampling rate numbers all the time in music. What, you know, sampling rate was that at? What kilohertz? And you hear the computer's capacity often measured in megahertz or gigahertz more often today. The gigahertz race got so ridiculously large that people lost track of keeping track of score by gigahertz and then things that ran better, things that had better thought processes going into, oh, how is this code really going to run? What should the hardware look like to run this code efficiently? Blindsided those people myopically consumed, occupied by the gigahertz race and ARM took over the world. ARM is taking over the world. A British incubated machine architecture, which can be the real hardware, it can be real ARM hardware, or it can be in another translation layer. So ARM hardware can be simulated by more complex hardware easily because it's reduced instruction. You can always make a reduced instruction on a complex, and you can also always do the reverse, make a complex instruction on a reduced. So which wins? There is no battle between reduced instruction set and complex instruction set anymore. The battle is between full vertical integration of components. Who can own more pieces and what gets put together into a finished product and get the efficiencies of moving it from one stage to the next. Many efficiencies are lost in the step of moving it from CPU to mobile phone. Some ARM, stock ARM CPUs are made like the Snapdragon from Quantel, but all they're doing is they're taking the ARM design and they're licensing it from the ARM company that doesn't make their own hardware. They just license ARM designs. Companies like Quantel or Samsung or TCME or whatever, I don't know, whoever makes the finalized chips that go into these custom designed devices, buy them in some cases from companies like Quantel and they use the Snapdragon, which is like the Intelification of ARM tech. ARM chip, ARM CPU manufacturers, uh, Snow, you know, uh, they, they just eyeball what an Intel-like ARM CPU should be, and you get something like a Snapdragon. Apple, on the other hand, knows what their final consumer product is going to be. They know what their new generation MacBook Air's impossibly thin full-day charge. How could this even be a computer? Attempts at innovation, because this is the kind of stuff they're good at doing now. If you can't innovate truly, you can get your form factor down as thin and svelte as you can get it because you own full vertical integration now from your licensed ARM technology, which is no longer specific chip design because all Apple needs is the machine instruction code set so that things can talk to each other. It's a thunking layer. Even though people want to build up what a machine instruction set is, because it taps into capabilities of the hardware, it's only ever tapping into some of the lowest common denominator capabilities of the hardware. It doesn't tap into the really cool stuff, so why build really cool stuff into it? This is part of ARM's you know, ultimate prevailing because it takes a minimalist attitude as to what else is there so it doesn't have to power as much other stuff between clock cycles as complex instruction sets do, which assume all kinds of other stuff is there. That needs refreshing, that needs pooling, that needs state checking. So through ownership of full integration, you can pair your M2 processor down 
to the least amount of metal required to deliver a MacBook Air. So they get lots of efficiencies in putting less hardware in their CPUs. Only the hardware they need, only exactly the caches they need. The story goes deep. Stories often go deep. Deeper than they would look like on the surface. And these details matter. Nuance matters. This is how Apple gets a full day charge out of such a thin device that has completely blurred the line between an iPad, because there's like about as much material now in the new MacBook Air as there is in an iPad. Is it a laptop or is it a, a tablet? Well, it's a laptop because those screens are still not touch sensitive. How can that be? How can a company have a product like an iPad and a product like a MacBook Air. I have to double check this that the MacBook Air screens are not touch screens because I'll be eating crow if MacBook Air screens are touch screens. How could Apple have gone so close to the middle from both sides and not connected it in the middle with a touch sensitive screen? Aren't the MacBook Airs some kind of colossal evasion at making a convertible, an iPad that has just a built-in keyboard, which they seem to refuse doing in all these radically expensive ways. Oh, keyboards are a, op are a 400, the keyboard plus its keyboard stand are a $400 optional accessory to the latest, you know, best iPads. Wait, what? I can get a whole iPad that is a convertible laptop thing for that same $400 as you can just get the keyboard and stand with in the Apple ecosystem. And it's not even, their, their Unix underneath of that is not even directly accessible without a hack on the iPad-like devices. And on the MacBook Air-like devices where it is accessible, it does not have an Apple-blessed free and open source repo. Like Canonical, like the Ubuntu repository is Microsoft blessed. Because when you open a PowerShell and admin mode and type WSL space minus minus install and go through the reboot, set up a username and password for your new account, when you log into that account, it's Ubuntu 20.04. Linux that you can apt update to see how latest of a version Microsoft plopped onto your machine. Always interesting to find out. Sudo apt update. Sudo apt update. That'll tell you how many updates are waiting for you, like after a fresh Windows install. You know how you have to do a system update and a reboot or two or three or four or five. It's not terribly different on Linux. After doing a fresh Linux install of, say, a distro such as Ubuntu, you want to do a sudo apt update, and then probably a sudo apt upgrade. If you're really paranoid about it, you want to restart that Linux machine, which is not so easy to do. You have to go back to the PowerShell, and you have to go WSL space minus minus Restart? I think it's restart. You have a command, you have a double minus command to restart the machine. And that will forcibly restart your Ubuntu 20.04 shell. <laughs> shell server, because it can run multiple shells from out of that one Ubuntu server it has now running in some Microsoft magical privileged way. Because it starts up fast. There's no waiting for Linux to boot anymore. The concept of waiting for Linux to boot under Microsoft, subsystem for Linux, is a thing of the past. It's just always going to feel like it's running. Once you have WSL space minus minus install command carried out, the truth is after a forced full restart of Windows, WSL, the Linux kernel, might not be in memory. But that is going to be such a rare condition because if you become a regular user of Linux terminal, such as I am, 
you're gonna have at least your first one opened up within minutes of rebooting of a full Windows restart. So now Linux kernel is in memory. Now that Linux kernel is in memory, my thinking goes, my final step that I'm just getting over now is that I will instantaneously be in my current preferred LXD container. A WSL new terminal, when I say new terminal from WSL, which is kind of the equivalent of going to your Ubuntu icon from your start menu, remember, from your start menu, menu, uh, menu your start menu. This is important stuff. It sounds like I'm talking about blah, 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 blah. But in a year or two, people are going to be tuning in and saying, oh, this guy was telling you exactly how to get over to Linux Terminal in 2022. Linux Terminal is key. Linux Terminal is more key than Unix Terminal because Linux won. I have been tempted to say Unix slash Linux won, and you are just as well off on BSD as you are on Ubuntu, but I no longer feel that way because the mainstream has settled on System D as the automated services API of the 21st century. So one must keep in mind that the true innovations were once again Apple's because Apple had to run system services under Unix that were reliable to a Mac to a Macintosh quality level requirement. Parts of the Mac OS that would remain invisible to most people. The only access people would ever have to this part of the unit of the Macintosh Unix operating system would be through graphical user interfaces that access these same command line type things, but through APIs that make it look like it's only accessible through a graphical user interface, through system tools that Mac makes available. You can hardly ma operate a Mac without a desktop and without icons. What is the concept of logging into a headless Mac? Is it the Darwin operating system? Maybe. And it was for that Darwin operating system that the precursor to System D was created. I don't know the name of the developer, and I don't know the name of the software, but it was profoundly generic. So profoundly generic that this German developer, this controversial German developer, again, whose name eludes me, but every time I hear it, I think I'm hearing Linus's name, but it's not. This German developer basically copied Apple's Darwin work to create Unix-like services, 24/7 long-running services. You're like, what make these ser What makes these services? Well, if you've done any developing of any sort, you know that when you run a program with an interpreter, you use the interpreter name first, say Python space file name usually the, the, that interpreter's extension, .py. So a very typical example of using the Python interpreter would be Python space file name .py. And that would say, take the file named file name .py and run it through the, uh, the Python interpreter. That's the command line interface. That command line interface is really built into everything underneath of stuff, no matter how much vendors want to hide it. There used to be old-fashioned BIOS, and you could see all this stuff scroll by you during boot up of PC clones. Windows machine circa Windows 3.1 before Windows 95 and Windows 7 all that stuff that 
you know, modernized windows and steps and secured because that old stuff that where you could see the script that started everything was highly hackable. And that highly hackable environment, the environment in which humans and viruses and Trojans, but <laughs> by design, humans could step in and take control over the boot process of that machine is a very special thing. That's the original moments at which humans still have control of machines. Humans will still have control of machines so long as there is some boot process, invisible or not, being controlled by a text file. That text file is read in. It's usually not compiled. It's usually kept as a plain .txt file. So without a proprietary compiling process, there's usually a way for you to step in and take control of that hardware. You're not a tech if you don't have that ability. You might think you're a tech, but chances are you're a proprietary sheep. Two miles, place the left two lanes to take exit 41A for side to Parkway toward Kings Park. You're a sheep of proprietary systems. When those proprietary systems change, you must change and grow. If, you know, if they say Simon Says, you do what they say. You're in a great game of Simon Says in order to maintain your value in the marketplace. Chances are the vendors will be making sure the skills they're bringing you to is what's valuable, so you'll gobble it up. You'll, you know, just like sheep grazing on grass, you will follow to where the grass looks greener. And in such a way, vendors will always be leading you to where they want you to go by making the grass always look greener in the next pasture and to make the pasture you're in seem all used up and no more opportunity because of course this is where all the sheep have been led and all opportunity for all people of average sheep level grazing ability have to eat the green grass that was that they were led to by the vendors that's web dev ladies and gentlemen that's what today's web dev is that's what being led from the mean, what was it, the mean a API, to React.js, to, uh, oh, mean was Angular, Microsoft's mean Angular, Angular stack. And then you were led to React.js, and from React.js you're all being led to Vue, and now after Vue you might be led to something else that comes after it, and it all goes in these cycles. Is it settling down? Is it settling down to some master JavaScript framework or two? The way it has in Python between Django and Flask. Sorry, uh, fast API and sorry pylons and, you know, sorry What would be a CMS system other than Django? <laughs> it's hard to even pick one. But there's a lot of competing things in the Python ecosystem for that uh, web uh, services. On the one hand, micro web services, creatively flexible and adaptive web microservices that abides by uh, async and await and had to undergo the growth of uh, concurrency, non-blocking I.O. is important in this space. But it also has to have a generic, flexible, minimizable, maximizable, scalable um, content management system built in that can support everything from becoming Instagram to becoming WordPress clones to be becoming corporate intranet software, you know, management software, uh, competitors to things like uh, Jira and Confluence. So what we're talking about is highly flexible frameworks for stamping out pre-built components to uh, all aspects of, of business and web uh, 
from stuff that would be considered more back-end-ish and how companies are run and communicate within companies and things like internets to things that are also more front-end like web commerce and shopping cart and having alternatives to, to WordPress with things like the WooCommerce engine, right? So, which are arguably part of free and open source's world as well. So, whew, the argument goes that there are different type of people who have different abilities to partake in and benefit from the world of tech. The world of tech is more and less available to you based on your vibe and your personality type. A large number of vibes and personality types will do better with being able to get better at their tools over time in a way that almost only Unix-like and increasingly so, only Linux seems to let you achieve and accomplish. You can get better at time, get better over time, get better at using time for sure. Get better at using the time made available to you by being able to automate a greater number of things. No, I guess this is not my accident. It's not 52, it's 51E. Okay, I can do that. You're gonna be able to make better use of your time by having things running for you and working on your behalf while you are doing other things. And it won't be one exclusive macro system that you're running. You will be able to create multiple instances with significantly different beating hearts of technology underneath. If you want one of your agents to be JavaScript and Node.js, running as a web server, fine. You can have that as one of your disposable appendages. You're saying keep left. I-50, is it? Okay, I keep left. Continue on I-495 East for 30 miles. 30 miles, so I'll get a last bit of video out of this. I'll be there right in time. I'll be there for the 10 a.m. Uh, stepping up ceremonies like I was last year for Akinikin on this same fateful video I, I shot, right? This is a year later. Oh my god. It's hard to believe. It's a very different camp this year. It's a different scouting experience here at this Long Island uh, camp than it was over in the, uh, let's see, Akinikin was, is that Pennsylvania camp? Uh, that might have been the Poconos. I'm not sure, I'll have to check. No, that was, that was New York still. Catskills, yeah. I remember the route I took. I drove along the Delaware River to get to it, which still could have been the uh, Delaware Water Gap. us who fancy ourselves have at least blue collar workers of tech. How can you be an idea person if you don't understand the plumbing? It's not that you have to be a radically crazy inventor and it's not that you have to be able to support enterprise scale systems. It's that you can create single instances of what could be supported in enterprise scale systems. It's that when you work as Mickey Mouse, the saucer's apprentice, and you figure out how to make the brooms do your cleaning, you don't do it incorrectly like Mickey did. You do it correctly. You do it correctly with one broom in local space, and then you make that formula available to non-local space. And the truth about the cloud is there's not unlimited broom room. They're not slamming more brooms into the
the same room, they do up to the extent that multi-core will support it. Eight cores, eight rooms. Anything beyond that, even operating system threads that allow task switching and multiplexing is an inferior technology to actual multi-cores and being a purist about, you know, one thread per, per, per core. Yes, there will be wasted downtime of your machine, but there will be 100% availability for when your tasks do need it. So what you actually do is instead of programming your tasks to have lots of downtime, you program your tasks to be real-time basic. They do stuff on a scheduled basis, basis which is real-time, always polling, polling, polling. That's the reality of the picture always polling. But to make it so that it never gets behind, that it never gets a backlog, it allows data to be dropped. So where you pull data, you also allow data to be dropped. And you should be able to program those types of things. And that is a long-running daemon. That is a long-running running python.py file that you can start as a Linux daemon. So you need, in, to be a tech, you need to be able to program long-running tasks. Now there's pre-packaged long-running tasks, which I do advocate. I'm doing all this so that I can do data pipeline, right? I'm getting to the point where doing local data pipelining on my machine, experimentally here and there, is no problem that it comes naturally, that it's part of my muscle memory and part of a way of doing it that won't be going away in two to five years. Like running it from a Windows Docker, right? There is other options. Why not just run these systems that you wanna run from Windows Docker? You'll have the system there, you'll run it. Well, it's because now you have this dependency coded in for Windows Docker. I don't want Windows. I don't wanna code more Windows dependencies into my process. I'm getting rid of my Windows dependencies, and the most clear way to do that is the LXC program under LXD. Duh! The API exists now for Windows independence. You too can be an independent from your Windows host machine, but you don't have to rush there today and lose your Windows hardware and driver advantage. Do not pretend there is not a hardware driver advantage, gaming advantage, mainstream advantage, peripherals working, which is another way of saying drivers advantage, accessibility to the games market if you're into that. Everything is offered first and best on the Windows platform. That's where the market is, except for mobile. Mobile is cutting in majorly into that market share. And then Microsoft totally flubbed it in mobile. Too little, too late, no matter how good their offerings were, because Windows Mobile turned out to be great, but they hung out on Windows CE too long or whatever their, you know, pre Microsoft mobile version was before tiles, right? What the start menu was kind of came to Windows Mobile first. And the start menu is more or less being phased out under Windows 7. There's a move away from, you know, they're trying to distance themselves from a superior product that could have worked if it were two years earlier. Oh, it didn't work, so instead of the purest world of superior user interfaces somehow prevailing, moving people to Metro, <laughs> they revert to Windows 7 again. Windows 11 is the next coming of Windows 7. Windows 10 was a hybrid between Windows Metro and Windows 7, right? Because what was 8? Windows 8, was there a Windows 8? Windows 8 was Metro. Right, Windows 8 was Metro. So if you went to Windows 8, you went to this odd, quickly abandoned Windows, which was approximately the same as 
the attempt to get everyone to move to v Vista. There was a universally hated version of Windows that Microsoft got off of as quick as possible and then tries to pretend doesn't exist. With a getting back to their core, what mostly Windows 3.1 looks like, right? What mostly the early Macs looked like, plus ArrowSnap, right? So Windows 11 is just an attempt to get back to the early clean look of the early Macs, Windows 3.1, an easier, simpler time where the operating systems didn't try to be these quirky mobile tile devices that did everything for you. But in doing that, they give up some of the few good things about Windows 10, which is a fixed position for, you know, for shutdown, a fixed position for settings, and instead, you know, the power and the shutdown, well, maybe power they kept in a fixed location. Maybe they chose that one thing for a fixed location for your menu. But everything else, including setting, settings, became floating. And then they took away the transitions that made virtual screens dear to me. So Windows 11 has reverted from Windows 10. It is not the cleaning up and purification that they may think it is. Windows 10 really was that. Because throwing in a few more absolute positions for critical things like settings is okay. It's okay in the same way that Linux is throwing in a few monolithic pieces for the user's own good. The Linux kernel itself for such high levels of compatibility. If everything's bound together, performance will be better and the machines that have been, that this single binary have been tested on will not have a possibility matrix of all different things it's been tested on. It either definitely has been tested through its halt software suite to work on the following list of hardware or it hasn't. There is no component grid of what's been tested and what has not that must exist for the microkernel design. I assume that Minix 5 must actually do this but not for as much capability levels of the hardware that Linux has to. Linux has to do it to everything that gets exposed to the user, probably even like the GPU and stuff. So exposing custom APIs through extensions and stuff, which is under the responsibility of the kernel, because if things are extendable or expandable, they must be so through a formal means that the core kernel provides. And that's why so much of the Unix way, really, is where files are put and what meaning files have because of where they were put. And to make sure that they were put there by a user who has the sufficient permissions to put a file there. And to make sure that the execute bit has been set. And to make sure that the contents of the file is, you know, valid and well-formed. XML language starts to come into the picture. And while they're not technically XML files, the same pedantic attention to detail that led to the XML language of it has to be both well-formed and valid. Therefore, its contents must follow a certain rule of arrangement to make it a good config file. So that's well-formedness. And then there's also validness, in addition to how elements must be found in relationship to each other. Does white space matter? What do colons and semicolons mean? Uh, what does white space mean and does it matter? Uh, after all those questions are answered, there's additional questions that must be answered that in this location, whose meaning we now know because of you know, well formedness is it valid? Is one of the valid values in this location? So there's always the questions of well formedness and validness, which may have different labels to it, but which the system files that you have to drop into place must abide by. You now have something that is a framework and has a convention. Conventional behavior and framework like stuff comes into existence with system D, which is a monolithic piece, which is laid over a monolithic piece, 
both of which are objectionable for being monolithic, and both of which violate the Unix way that made operating systems this powerful able to exist in the first place. So, the question is one of purity. An 80-20 will compromise. And the excitement about getting increased performance out of your hardware over the portability of your software. This is the great question. How much do you want your current experience to change in order for it to be more pleasant due to what today's hardware can offer? Touch screens, languages other than Python and JavaScript and Unix, Unix shell and C. Languages that just make your heart sing for joy. And use of those languages through interfaces that might not be there tomorrow. So swing, the swing language to create Apple iPhone apps, and I guess also more and more often desktop apps. So how does one explain the Swing operating system? Well, it's got a lot of power of what Xcode used to have, but it's a Python-like language, right? So it's always Python-like, right? So when it's Apple trying to make a better environment for Apple developers, it's Python-like. When it's Google trying to make a better compiled C system language for concurrency and deployment in the Go language, how do they describe it? Well, it's Python-like. Resolving multi-core complexity in the one true way that gets rid of complexity by making a uh, global interpreter lock for one core and then using one Python instance per core and better yet using one Python instance per one operating system Linux uh, yeah, uh, there's a Freudian slip one operating system instance per core so the road this Pied Piper is leading you down is to go from no matter what knowledge you have today, you've got something proprietary. You came up through some proprietary route. Statistics indicates Windows X. You came up through a Windows route. The great Windows routes darling were 3.1 95 2000 7 10 that's where we are today many hearts belong to Windows 10 the forced schism of Windows 11 is a bigger deal than it's been in prior years. We know this because Microsoft can no longer charge for an operating system. Operating systems are free, right? In addition, you have to deal with every headache of heterogeneous hardware because you carry on the torch of IBM compatible open systems. Wait, what? IBM compatible open systems? Yes. IBM made their uh, BIOS reverse engineerable. Phoenix BIOS and all this stuff, which opened the door to IBM clones in the days before IBM even supported graphics normally. This is when refrigerator sized computers were coming down to you know, file cabinet size and half file cabinet size and then tower sized and rack mountable. At this point, in order to treat them like commodities and get that same advantage that Vax users got, you know, these are 
industrial refrigerator size computers. You could have two side by side and they could be running side by side in such a way that either one could fail and the other one could take over. So eventually, when PC hardware got to that level of performance and reliability, they wanted a unit of computing. So one of those units of computing became a rack mountable, one RU. One RU is probably a single processor on it of a titanium, you know, one of Intel's dead-end processors. Uh, became the standard of computing unit for one rack mountable unit of computing power. And, the, and in the era of co-location, that was a very beloved unit of computing. And so unit of computings become these uh, easy mental frameworks to use when doing computing for ourselves. What kind of computing power do we have? What are we borrowing from the cloud? There is no room where you can pile up infinite brooms of Mickey Saucer as Apprentice. There are just lots of rooms made available in the cloud. Well, why can't I make my own local room or two or three or four available at home? There's no reason you can't. You absolutely can. The only thing is an initial expense of about $500 these days was just nothing compared to the cloud expenses you'll accumulate. And it's time independent. You can have one. I bought mine somewhere in like, I don't know, 2019 or something. And here we are in mid-2022. I'm not going to be getting rid of it for another two to five years. It gives me a universal unit of computing, which is easy and pleasurable to get these days, even when you're starting from a Windows platform with the following magical incantation. First, open a PowerShell that has admin privileges. Next, type WSL space minus minus install. Enter. So WSL is the first word and hyphen hyphen install, all lowercase is the second word. You're feeding the program called WSL the argument called install. That's going, in, that's going to install Ubuntu 20.04 on your machine, which is a small problem. Because it's Ubuntu 20, now it's Ubuntu 18.04 that makes the installation of LXD, that makes the program LXC easily and readily available. This is the future, ladies and gentlemen. This is the best route to allow a Pied Piper to lead you along because it's command line interface APIs to a tool that's going to be mainstreamed and embraced as the way to instantiate new virtual instances of Linux. They're container instances of Linux, but they're also virtual instances of Linux because labels are stupid. Labels are stupid. So to minimize the work incurred in experimentation while maximizing the language, the long livedness of your language of virtualization, to make the language that you learn to virtualize and containerize as long lived and uh, interruption resistant as possible, you need to learn the LXC command under Linux, under LXD. The LXC command is key. I am doing this already through an intermediary, the intermediary being my QNAP NAS. So I have what is known as a network application server in NAS. NAS has come, home NAS has come from two main companies. QNAP, which is what I have. It's a decision to even let people know that. But I have hardened it to a fairly uh, 
you know, far degree. I, in fact, I, I hardened it to a far enough degree that I could not access it when I changed, when I moved, when I changed what Wi-Fi router it was connected to. When I went to the Wi-Fi router of uh, Blue Ridge Cable, which I was using in the Poconos, to the Wi-Fi router of Verizon that I'm using at home, my QNAP router lost connection to everything. And the reason for it is I had assigned it a static IP on the network. I actually got into my um, Wi-Fi's router at home. I Googled how to do it with Blue Ridge routers. I logged into it. I changed the default admin password. I said only give out dynamic IPs through this range and make this other thing dedicated to this IP. And I gave my router, uh, no, then I, after I configured my router, I went into the software through direct connection. I actually connected in through the HDMI port and keyboard and mouse. And I said, your IP on this uh, local network segment shall be this IP. <laughs> that very, very much hardwired my QNAP router for a inaccessible by the network, by the internet at large. There was not even, you could, I believe I had it configured that you could not even use a network address translation table rule, which you can address the, which you can typically add so that you can run web servers at home. When you do this, you want to make a, um, a DMZ, a demilitarized zone. And one of the key mistakes in all of home hosting is to turn your whole home network into your DMZ. In other words, you don't have a DMZ because any traffic that you allow to come in through your network router is on your internal private IP network, one step behind your Wi-Fi router. Not good. I believe I may actually have that now. I have to go through the steps of, uh, of undoing that at this point because when you do a dumbass maneuver like I do, like move somewhere without changing those network settings, you are naturally cut off from the integrations between that IP and any host thing because a new virtual, a new network is created behind your new router and your subnets, and your you know, static IP configurations change. So as a temporary stopgap, you reset the local network settings of your QNAP device. And you can do that through a three second poke, a three second reset poke. You don't even need access. I went through the rigmarole to get direct machine access, connecting the HDMI cable to the TV, connecting a keyboard, connecting a mouse. And it turned out I did not need to. I could have just poked a hole with a uh, toothpick for three seconds, heard the beep, and known that I have the, the non-full, because there's a factory level reset too. We do not want the factory level reset, ladies and gentlemen. We just want the local network uh, reset. And by local, I mean on that machine. It doesn't touch your network. It gets rid of static IP and configuration on your QNAP. So if it's sitting on a network that has a DHCP server, it will get assigned one and then QNAP Finder will work. And once QNAP Finder works, you're golden. You can log into that through the web user interface, through the standard 8080 port on a private IP, which is not accessible to a public IP without uh, port 8080 mapping. And port 8080 mapping is not going to be done by default unless you know how to log into your uh, Wi-Fi router, your ISP provided, usually, a uh, Wi-Fi router, and create a network address translation rule that forwards port 8080 to the IP that was given out dynamically by your DHCP server. Now, 
if the routing does, if the network address translation layer does exist, then port scanning could show up your QNA server. And that's the main thing I really um, want to be cautious of. I want to be immune to port scanning uh, technologies. Just left onto New York 24 North Edwards Avenue South. But up until that time, you know, that I uh, make my, my own new subnet mask, I feel pretty good. And uh, what you want is another place to run your code using the same LXD uh, API uh, as you're using on uh, your Windows subsystem for Linux. In other words, you want a local cloud server that you're not paying whatever, that no vendor gets their hand in your pocket for your kicking the tires. And you want it to be set up better than a Raspberry Pi. So many people at this point will say, oh, just run a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, well, I defy you to keep that Raspberry Pi running in your house 24-7. The exposed cable issue is an issue. You can wrap it up into a nice little server and have yourself some, you know, micro server and take all the responsibility uh, for the server software and not necessarily have multi-core. Well, I guess new Raspberry Pis do have multi-core. This is a much more practical project on today's Raspberry Pis than it used to be. But if you're like me and would like a little bit of uh, shortcuts, this is the place to get your shortcut through a QNAP or Symbology. I believe it's Symbology is the other major vendor. I should have mentioned it way back in the video when I got up to this. I'm an hour and a half into the video. I'm about 3.2 miles away from my destination. So I'll wrap this up soon. This is a good one. I'll have to wonder uh, what to label this thing. My theory about having uh, the two phones for navigation and shooting video uh, that <laughs> spares me from getting lost is has paid off tremendously. So it's a multi-core lesson right there. Sometimes multi-cores are not to be in the same host device. Your host device is sometimes the human mind. You put multiple processing units to work by having them just each do what they do best under the hypervisor of a human being. That is a very valid approach. And that kind of approach is what we're simulating when we use containers and we manage resources by allocating resources under those containers. It is, is it a single core CPU container? Is it a multi-core? Because you can make a multi-core just by doing containers. doesn't cut off those options. It's the ultimate shell game in divvying up your local Linux resources in a way that keeps you from polluting any single master Linux instance that's running the show and also keeps any single instance that you created as a preferred working version reproducible in other locations uh, in the cloud running 24-7. So whatever you do on your laptop here is almost certainly not going to be running 24-7 because you close your laptop, it goes to sleep, but you did it in a way which is ultimately portable to generic cloud platforms. Ultimately portable to generic cloud platforms. One of which I advocate running in your own house using Container Station or something like it that comes with uh, the QNAP NAS. I have a friend who advocates using just the Windows Docker host, but you know, I say that doesn't take care of the part that is really my uh, my rebirth here, my rising from the ashes in tech comes from the single trick of realizing the promise of containerization for an everyday casual uh, hacker type person, hacker in the good sense. You want to know enough about your hardware and equipment to step in and, and take it over. You want to be a hacker of generic plumbing. You want to be able to hack generic plumbing stuff 
well. And take control of most generic hardware you will find today at home, in the cloud, embedded into devices, embedded into droids and cars. There is nothing that doesn't have embedded Unix or Linux in it. Sometimes they try to control stuff real tightly and you'll find QNX and some proprietary, you know, purchased Unix in there. Um, but more often you'll find stuff from the free and open source world that can be used without much licensing, uh, you know, uh, encumbrance. But you do have to be careful for things that are released under the GPL2 license, because if you make commercial money with it, you have to give back your innovations, like the way the WRT router under Linksys did. So always know your licenses. That's part of the, uh, the deal. But the deal of free and open source, so long as you know your licenses, you've got a, uh, a very delightful uh, breed and brand brand because it is somewhat branded. You're branded somewhere under Richard Matthew Stolman, sorry. Uh, and breed because these things can be bred and new derivatives made and parts of systems that you want kept while other parts thrown out, uh, customized and interacting with the proprietary bits to your heart's content. And, uh, you know, I'll have to stop for gas on the way back, for sure. Maybe I'll wrap up this video by showing the clever Take way the next left onto Sound Avenue. I'm holding the second phone. I don't want to risk it yet because I don't want to stop the video by accident, but I would like to show you how the second phone is mounted that is giving me my, my directions. I'm actually quite uh, happier, uh, kind of uh, proud of it. Now 9.30, it's the time I was told to arrive for scouts, but I'm also uh, two minutes away. Continue on Sound Avenue for three quarters of a mile. So all is good. All is good in the neighborhood. And there's some coffee. Mm. Get psychologically ready for my kid. I'll let him drive just this long, an hour and 40 minutes, uh, back home. They're gonna wanna go home for the comfy cozy factor, which is perfectly fine. And we'll have some interesting uh, talk on the way. Can't wait to hear all about uh, week-long scout camp. These things in print, they are a different person now after scout camp. Quarter mile, turn right. Than the, than the them they were when I dropped them off. This is always very interesting. Always very interesting. Take the next right. Boy, they've got a lot of uh, sign updating to do. Camp Baiting Hollow, Suffolk Family Council, Boy Scouts of America. Those shines are not so easily updated. In 800 feet, turn right. I don't think the stepping up ceremonies have occurred yet. I think those occur at 10. I might need to find a restroom on the way. There's plenty of activity around the cars, meaning I think uh, people bringing their stuff places. Have places to bring their stuff. And I will park my car as close as I can now, knowing the uh, 
the lay of the land a little better than I did before. I don't have to be clumped together with the other cars. And I am parked now. I will show you. There we have it. I have uh, this uh, lovely thing here, which is going to be my new camera holder that takes the place of this, <laughs> plus uh, a couple of uh, hair ties I was using to attach the phone onto that. I now actually have a formal clip uh, for doing that sort of thing. And it was part of uh, this box of stuff. And I'm going to finish some of my last of my coffee. gonna go find their stepping up ceremony. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon and don't forget to subscribe and thumbs up the video and follow me for an eclectic mixture of life and tech and obsolescence proofing through Unix-like operating systems which is more and more becoming Linux because system D.